Hi, this is Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of October 30th, 2023. The weekly top three is a regular segment on The Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on both Facebook Live and YouTube Live, as well as via streaming audio from the show's website, weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael weekly in the first hour of Tuesday's show from 6.10 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages, also on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets website, as well as the project's page on national blog site, medium.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, reflecting on the administration's recent proposals to subsidize Cook Inlet gas, we ask whether Alaska Republicans have given up on the free market. Second, we examine yet another pitch by Alaska Democrats for increased state spending without also addressing the issue of who they propose to pay for the spending. And third, we look at some good news about a state push that potentially would have added even more pressure for increased K-12 funding. And now, let's join Michael. Brad, um, you got there's some doozies on here this week. Uh, I got to tell you, and my head is just spinning with some of the stuff that's going on here. So let's start off with number one. Uh, a question: Are the Republicans in the state of Alaska giving up on the market economy, on the free market? Are they have they just decided to just pitch that to the curb in light of? getting whatever we want. What, what, give us your thoughts here. Let's hit it. Let's hit this from the beginning. So this is all about the cook inlet and this is all about cook inlet gas and the announcements that the Republicans have made, the Repu- Dunleavy administration has made the last two weeks first by the department of natural resources head to reduce uh, 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 the royalties, change the royalties from a fixed royalty to a net profits royalty uh, on new leases. And then last week, an announcement by Dunleavy himself, uh, that they were going to submit legislation to reduce royalties on existing leases, not on existing production, but on existing leases where there's where there isn't any production yet, uh, and reduce that royalty uh, down uh, significantly. Um, and then the to sort of pile on uh, the the House Republican majority uh, issuing a press release shortly after Dunleavy's press conference saying, "Oh, that's a good thing. We want to we want to pursue that." So here's here's my problem with all that. The, the, in, in, a, in a market economy, what is supposed to happen when you have a supply shortage or an excess demand is price is supposed to operate. And, and, and price is supposed to increase the, the, the price that willing buyers are, are prepared to pay to willing sellers is supposed to increase to the level necessary to provide Here's the word that the Republicans use, but they use it wrongly to provide an incentive to the producers to produce additional product uh, to meet the demand. Price is the leveling is the leveling uh, um, uh, technique uh, in a market economy. And it's not that it's not that it's not operating in this economy. I mean, I've been it, I was back in some of these discussions in the early 20 teens when we were going through this before. And it's not that the producers, that there isn't a price at which the producers would be willing to explore and produce. It's just that it's a very high price. And it's a price that the the purchasers, in in the case of the Cook Inlet, NSTAR and the electric utilities, which is now Chugach, used to be Chugach and MLMP, but now it's Chugach. It's at a price that 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 the purchasers don't want to pay. And and so, and they and they don't want to pay it because they're concerned that it would be a high price that would get them in trouble with their consumers and with their with their ratepayers if they get pushback on it. 
and that consumers would look for other alternatives than perhaps look for other alternatives than the price that, that is being charged by the utilities, like additional uh, 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 conservation measures, additional insulation, additional in, in the case of the heating market or renewables in the case of the uh, in the case of the electric market. So what the, the normal market function would function here. But you've got you've got the demand side, the purchase side that doesn't want to pay the price. Um, and so what's the Dunleavy administration doing in this situation? What are Republicans doing in this situation? <laughs> they're intervening in the market. They're 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 creating uh, an intervention in the market to subsidize the price. And that subsidy is going to come in the form is proposed to come in the form of reducing supply costs by reducing the level of royalty that the state would take um, uh, out of production. If the if price was allowed to operate, a number of things might happen. But one of the thing, one of the things that might happen if price was allowed to operate, if the purchasers were willing to pay the price the producers uh, uh, wanted in order to in order to sell, is that the price would go up, and the royalties to the state would increase because the royalties under the current leases are tied to are tied tied to price. So if the market operated all the state would, South Central would have higher energy costs. I grant you that. But the, but the state as a whole would have higher royalties, would have higher revenues, would have lower de deficits, and we'd have higher PFDs because, because the PFDs are now being cut to match the deficit. So it would all shake out that higher royalties would, higher price would result in higher royalties, would result in, in lower PFD cuts. But the, but the Dunleavy administration and, and the Republicans in general are intervening in the market, want to intervene in the market to avoid that happening and to subsidize, essentially, by lowering supply costs at the expense of the state, subsidize um, uh, uh, supplies uh, into, uh, into, uh, into South Central, into the, into the Anchorage market, the Cook, the Cook Inlet market. And that's just, you know, that's something you'd expect out of Democrats. Market intervention, government intervention in market function is something you would expect out of Democrats, but not something you should expect out of Republicans. I will say this. It's better what Dunleavy is proposing is slightly better than what uh, Parnell did back in the 20 teens when he proposed, when he essentially, he and the legislature essentially passed a bunch of credits that directly transferred money right. from the state into, uh, into the producers. And that was... I mean, that was more market intervention, but this is still market intervention uh, by the by the Dunleavy administration, by but, those who on any given day will say, oh, we believe in markets. We believe in the free market. Right, we believe in market right. function. Uh, but 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 Brad, we must do something. I mean, that's you know, you can I mean, I can hear it already. But 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 we've got to do something. Not that the market will take care of itself, not that things like that will will go forward. But, you know, we have got to do something and be seen to be doing something to make this happen. That's the thing. This is this is all about being seen. And some of the and some of the optimism on some of the what are the uh, what are the uh, uh Comments in here. This is again from the James Brooks article in the Alaska Beacon talking about the governor's announcement. He says the problem isn't one of supply. Cook Inlet gas remains or Cook Inlet remains gas rich, but one of development. There are a few other producers who have been slow to drill new wells, including Hillcourt. Uh, so, I mean, but OK, you you know, there's gas out there. So it's making I mean, this is it's they've got to do something. They've got to be seen doing something. The, the, what they what they what they're really saying when you strip through all this is we've got to subsidize the Anchorage energy market, the South Central energy market. That's really what they're saying. And we're willing to do it at the expense of the remainder of the state. Uh, at the expense of, of, of reducing royalty income and as a result, increasing PFD cuts. We're willing to do it at the remainder of the state, but we've got to subsidize the, the Anchorage market. I mean, if the market if the market was allowed to operate, what would happen is the next best alternative, which is likely LNG imports, would be on the horizon. That's where we are now. And, and, and purchasers who would be purchasing the LNG imports would say, look, before we go down this road, we're willing to pay you a price that's near to what we would be paying the LNG imports, but 
but in order to avoid the LNG imports, we want a little bit of a, of a, of a discount off that. That's the price we're willing to pay. And the producers would respond either, yes, that's an acceptable price that will, that will incentivize us to produce or no, it won't. In which event we bring in a better alternative, the, the better alternative, the less, the, ec the more economically efficient alternative, which is, which is LNG. But what, what the Dunleavy administration and what the Parnell administration did, I mean, my problems with this go back to the Parnell administration. What they're doing is they're shortcut is they're short circuiting the market. They're not allowing the market to operate. They're, they're, they're taking, you know, Chugaches and NSTARs in transigence in, in offering higher price. They're taking that as, as sort of a given and they're saying, okay, well, we'll intervene in the market. <laughs> we'll help right. you out and we'll come in and we'll reduce the state's royalty in order to subsidize the producers. I mean, the producers are going to get the same margin, right? It's just that the state's taking the hit or else they wouldn't, or else they won't, they won't invest. I mean, the producers are all about margins. They don't really care what the price is. They're all about margins. And, 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 and what the state's saying is, okay, we'll subsidize you. We'll give you the same margin by reducing your supply cost. And, and, and so you won't have to charge as much to the to South Central, to the, to the consumers to, uh, to, to incentive or to get, to incentivize you to, to produce. It's, it's market failure. I mean, and the Dunleavy administration is allowing the intransigence of the purchasers to pay the price necessary to elicit the supplies that the Dunleavy administration itself admits are there. It's, it's allowing that intransigence of the purchasers to pay the supply to, to, to control the state, to control what the state does, to, to set royalty levels. I mean, it's just, it's a mess. And it's a mess anytime you intervene in markets. And now we've got Republicans in the state of Alaska intervening in markets in order to create subsidies for, 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 for South Central in this case. I also think you're scooping up a tremendous amount of hopium here, thinking that somehow uh, that, that because there's, they would spend less, that somehow that would increase our PFD. I love how your optimism on that is. I mean, it's, it's definitely verging into the hopium category because they're going to spend every dollar. They would use that dollar on something else if they didn't spend it on that. But that's, I mean... It's, but it's true. This this whole idea of intervening in the market somehow they're smarter than market forces. That's the that's the answer. And we see that time and time and time again. Government's always been smarter than market forces, not not letting it even itself out. But somehow they'll be able to smooth out the highs and the lows, and all they end up doing is creating a lower average for everything. Donna asks the question that I think several people are asking themselves. Is Brad saying that Cook Inlet LNG extraction would happen without the proposed discounts or that Alaska should just import LNG at higher prices? And I think what he's saying is one of those two things was going to happen anyway. We're looking for the lesser. We're looking for the one that's going to be most affordable, right? I mean, the, one of the two is going to happen. So which one is it going to be? But the government shouldn't be intervening to try and make one happen over the other. Is that what you're saying, Brad? Am I, am I summating that properly? Well, we'll never know because, because we're not allowing the market to operate. I mean, well, the state's just throwing in subsidies. We don't know if the amount of subsidies are right or if they're wrong or if they're too much. I mean, the, as we talked about on last week's show, um, there is existing statutory authority for DNR, which has control over state leases oil and gas leases for DNR to reduce royalties where the producer can show, can demonstrate that, that reducing the royalty would produce, would, would produce, would result in additional production, would result in additional development and additional production. There's existing statutory, statutory authority on the books for DNR to do that, both with respect to new leases and with respect to existing leases, new production areas uh, in existing leases. Um, which is a subsidy, but at least it's a targeted subsidy uh, uh, in that case. If we're going to go down the road, at least it's targeted on those where the producer demonstrates that this additional uh, this additional relief would result in uh, additional development and, and and likely additional additional production. What the Dunleavy administration is proposing to do is just give a blanket uh, uh, exception, a blanket subsidy across the board. For all new leases and all new fields, I mean, what this latest announcement is, is all new fields inside existing leases, give a blanket, whether the producer 
can demonstrate whether the producer is 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 right. can, can demonstrate that it needs the needs the relief or or not. Just give it away. So and it's true, and it's for the life of the field that we talked about this last week, right? Because you said the answer is not just to give you know leases and fields without royalties, you know, ad nauseum or or forever, but instead you know give the give the lease as it is right now with the royalty and then say for the time being we'll eliminate the royalty until such time as we deem that it needs to kick back in but if they start it without the royalty then that's it it's the lease forever right that's kind of what you said last week well i that's sort of where our discussion went last week what the dunley yeah. administration is proposing is in fact limited i mean they're proposing to reduce royalties for in the legislation that, that the governor outlined his press release, he's proposing to reduce the royalty for 10 years. And then presumably it kicks up to some other level, although he was unclear that the discussion didn't, didn't identify what that, what that other level is. That sort of matches what, what the, what the oil tax does on the North slope uh, for new field discoveries um, in, in existing leases for new field discoveries. There's a reduced tax uh, for 10 years, maybe it's five years now, they amended that, but, but there's a reduced, uh, 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 tax for a given period. And then, and then the regular tax kicks back in. So the governor is limiting it, but, but my point last week that sort of led to that discussion was what if, you know, in this exploration, they find a pika, uh, a, a gas pika or even, right. even right. an oil pika, right. uh, a huge amount. Uh, and and such that it would have been economic to produce anyway, uh, even at the existing uh, royalty rate. Indeed, might even generate some taxes for us. Um, and but we've given a blanket a blanket uh, right. uh, release at least for a period of time a blanket uh, uh, waiver uh, for royalty right. to that. Look, the I think market, Brian, to, to get to get I, back to get back to Donna's point, the market sometimes does demand higher prices. Yes, that's what markets do. And, 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 and we, we accept that in other situations. Now we're saying in this situation, though, we're not going to accept that. I think Brian summates it nicely. He says, no, we're looking for a market choice. That's what we're looking for. And I would agree with that. And we shouldn't be giving away our resources. That's the, I mean, you know, we, we can agree on that. We shouldn't be giving them away or again, violating the whole market principle and allow government to continue to intervene. The Michael Duke Show, number two of the weekly top three, Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets, is our guest. You can find him at ak4sb.com or on Facebook or Twitter, X, whatever they're calling it these days. Uh, he was willing to argue with you on any point you want uh, as you go through there. Uh, Brad, number two of the weekly top three. Uh, and this is just, again, more... Uh, I I can't even wrap my brain around it. This piece, it's uh, more spending without the question of who pays. This is a piece from Donna Mears over uh, Representative Donna Mears about Medicaid cuts. And there are there's so much wrong with this article, so much wrong with this opinion piece. But uh, give me give me your thoughts on it. <laughs> You know, I, we ought to switch roles. I ought to just tee this up and let you take off. Oh, my uh, God. I, about I'm this gonna, article. Trust it, me, I'm going to tear this apart in the next hour because I'm going to go through this thing line by line and just point to the absolute insanity that this article indicates. Go ahead. Uh, well, the headline tells it all. The headline is, and this is, as you said, a piece by Donna Mears, Representative Donna Mears, Medicaid cuts threaten the broader economy. And, and basically, <laughs> this article says... We need to restart. We've had a bunch of Medicaid cuts. It starts out with the with the with the fact that we've had a bunch of Medicaid cuts since COVID, because the feds have reinstituted the rule that you have to prove you're 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 qualified for Medicaid, uh, which is a standing rule uh, standing rule before COVID. It was suspended during COVID. Now reinstituted. You have to prove you qualify for Medicaid in order to have Medicaid uh, continue uh, uh, after the after after a qualification period. Um, and, and we've had a bunch of, of disqualifications or, un, or, or, or absence of requalifications occurring as a result of going back into this qualification rule. And there's various theories on why that is. Um, Mears's, uh, Representative Mears' uh, uh, guesstimate is that it's because people don't know that they need to requalify or they aren't getting the paperwork or they've moved or they don't have the time or, or various excuses on why they haven't requalified. 
Um, and but the the net result of whatever the reason is, the net result is there's been a significant drop uh, in Medicaid qualifications in the state. That results in a drop in both state aid uh, to Medicaid as well as state spending for Medicaid. State roughly uh, uh, covers 50% of the cost of Medicaid. There's some exceptions to that, but plus or minus is 50% of the cost. So there's been a, a reduction in federal aid for Medicaid, federal payments for Medicaid, and a reduction in state payments going out the door for Medicaid. And and Mears, is, <laughs> Mears in an effort to try to argue that, that we ought to, you know, do something about this qualification issue. We ought to, we ought to, you know, suspend the rules, or we ought to do something to requalify all these people that are being coming becoming unqualified. That the reason we ought to do that is because Medicaid payments into the medical community are so are so important. The medic, the hospital, the health community in in, in Anchorage in particular, but throughout the state, uh, generally the health community is a big contributor to the economy. Um, Medicaid is a big part of the funding for the health community. If we see a drop off in that funding, we see a drop off in the in, in funds going to the health community and we see a drop off in uh, uh, in economic activity. And in fact, she she does a calculation that tries to show a drop in GDP, state GDP, that will result from this unfunding of uh, of, of Medicaid and and goes so far as to say it will result in a recession. Uh, in the state uh, as a result of the drop in Medicaid. And so she argues for, you know, we need this, we need this additional Medicaid spending. We need this additional uh, uh, money to go into the, uh, to go into the economy. All of that, I mean, you're going to, you're going to blast that for the next hour. I am absolutely confident. My point is this, whenever anybody talks about increased spending, whenever anybody talks about, we need to spend more, in this case, we need to, we need to rebuild the state spending for Medicaid. My question is always should be the first question out of my mouth is who pays? Who are you proposing pay for that additional spending? And it's a question that nobody, <laughs> the Republicans don't answer it when I when we're talking about royalty or suspended royalty payments. The Democrats don't answer it when they're talking about increased spending for K through 12 or reinstituted spending for for Medicaid. Nobody talks about who pays. Nobody's willing to address that issue. The result of which is it's coming out of the PFD. The result of which is it's just silently being, you know, Bert silently reducing the PFD to balance the budget, uh, taxing middle and lower income Alaska families to, to balance the budget. And it's just, it galls me every time I see one of these. You know, if we would have had more in the first segment, I would have talked about how it galls me that the Republicans aren't talking about who's going to pay for these subsidies that they want to throw into South Central. It galls me when the Democrats have these have these have these commentaries that say we need to increase K through 12 or we need to increase K Medicaid or we need to increase anything and they don't talk about who's going to pay for it. They don't want to confront that because they know what the answer is and they don't want to have to admit that it's the very people they claim to be helping that are going to be hurt uh, as a result of uh, as a result of the increase increasing PFD cuts in order to pay for these sorts of things. Well, and the worst part about this one is it's not just the Alaskans, uh, not just the state of Alaska part of the kick, but again, it's more about sucking more money out of the federal government to bolster the Alaska GDP. That's, I mean, that's the worst part about this is that, oh, we won't get this federal aid and the federal aid helps bolster the economy. And I mean, is that what we want is we want to create a dependency society where we are dependent on all these federal dollars paid for by other people, by the way. We we take in much more in federal revenue than we expend out in tax uh, in tax revenues for the uh, for the federal for the federal government. And so that's what it becomes. We just become a welfare state more and more with every passing year. And we become more dependent on the largesse of the government just to continue to survive. Well, in the case in the case of Medicaid, Michael, it's actually both. I mean, because, as I said, Medicaid is split about 50 oh, yeah. 50 between between state state funds and federal funds. And so she's 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 not only complaining about you know the absence of federal funds that we want these federal funds back, but but by implication she's also saying oh we need more state funds we need the state funds to match to do that. This this isn't I mean this sort of of um, this sort of uh, uh, you know I want more federal funding isn't partisan. I mean, you see Dan Sullivan talk about it when he talks about stationing yeah. more troops or more airplanes right. or yeah. or more military in Alaska. 
it's it and 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 you know when people talk about more broadband in Alaska, more money for broadband, more money to help GCI meet meet their meet their objectives uh, in Alaska, or you know more money for for roads for you know federal funds for roads, or it, it's just it goes on and on and on. This is another example of it, uh, but it just goes on and on and on. No, I mean, look, I, that's the thing. All I can do is when I picture Alaskans, you know, in general in the United States, they're the poor cousins that are sitting there with their hand out of the back of the line going, you know, please, we need more. We need more. We need. Now, I would I could make an argument about roads and infrastructure that we were promised that we never got and uh, that those monies have been misspent or misappropriated over the years. And we still deserve the infrastructure that we were promised at statehood, yada, yada, yada. But the thing is, is that that's just a fraction of the money that we're getting. The rest of it's going to programs like this, which is just freaking stupid that we cannot in our own state be self-sufficient in these cases when we are really one of the richer states in the country and we have kind of access to our own destinies here but instead we've gotten so used to lying over and on the on the government teat that we don't even know we can't even imagine a place where we are are, are self-sufficient in our own uh in our own state yep yeah well it's <laughs> it, it it is it is that also and certainly, you know, her argument is we need we need these funds, these federal funds to help bolster the 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 uh, uh, bolster the GDP or else we're going to go into a recession. It's certainly it's certainly in part that. But it's also in part I mean, in the case of Medicaid, it's also in part we need more state funding. We need to, you know, where we might have savings, where we might have savings in state spending as a result of the reduction in Medicaid costs. We shouldn't do that. We need to we need to bolster we need to get medicaid back up and we need to recycle those state funds right back into the health sector or else you know the health sector may decline and that's going to kick off all sorts of uh, all sorts of bad recession so it's it's well, a interesting article as i say you're probably going to spend the entire second hour on various aspects of it oh, but i just wanted to make clear that that it's another one of those who we need more funding we need more state spending we need we need we need the state to step in here but yeah, I don't want to address who's going to pay for all that. I mean, well, and as you said, this there's a theme of this. I mean, this could be again applied back to number one, and we got a couple of minutes here. So, I mean, back to number one, talking about again Republicans intervening in the market in the in the gas for cook inlet gas. It's the same kind of thing. Nobody's asking. I mean, this is a theme that could almost go through every one of the weekly top three items every freaking week, which is who pays. And the question is, who is paying? And as the state continues to expend more money than it takes in year after year after year, the bottom line is the people who pay are the median and lower income Alaskans. Those are the ones who are paying because their money, their share as royalty owners in the state of Alaska is being taken by the government by force and used and spent uh, to bolster up all this government government programs that are out there, and they're the ones that are paying the highest percentile price of any of this. Yeah, exactly right, Michael. And and the other and the other piece of that, it's not only that middle and lower income Alaskans are paying for it, paying disproportionate, vastly disproportionately for it, for it. But it's that it's that it's that the top twenty percent and the oil industry and non residents aren't paying any of it. And so they have no incentive to put on the brakes. I mean, from the standpoint, from the standpoint of the Mirrors article, the docs are the, the doctors, health community are the real beneficiaries of Medicaid, right? I mean, the money doesn't go to middle in to lower income Alaska families. It 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 is paid on their behalf to the docs. It's the docs who get the money, the hospital, the, the the medical community that gets the money. They're the ones that get it. Yet, because we use PFD cuts to, and the docs are in the top 20%, yet because we use PFD cuts to fund it, the docs don't have to pay anything for it. So there's no disincentive for them to say more, 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 more. I mean, I, you and I go back to this sometimes, but, but one of the sh most shocking things was to me was early in the Dunleavy administration when he was still pressing for spending cuts and Medicaid was one of the areas that he was, that he was pressing for spending cuts. Uh, a meeting that he went to with doctors where the doctor said, what are you doing? <laughs> you can't cut this area. This is, this is hugely important to us. This is a bunch of our, a bunch of our revenue. You can't, it wasn't, 
it wasn't the it wasn't the you know the sick and and, and infirm that were complaining about the Medicaid cuts. It wasn't their groups. It was the doctors that were complaining about about cuts to Medicaid because because it was cutting their revenue. But they're fine. They're fine with continuing that spending and using PFD cuts to pay for it because they get the best of both worlds. They get the revenue and they don't have to pay for it. They don't have to they don't have to contribute to the cost. So yeah. there's I mean the there, there's all sorts of problems that we are creating in this economy by the subsidies that we're doing um, uh, and and who's paying the costs of those subsidies and who's not paying the costs uh, of those subsidies. Again, the one question that doesn't seem to get asked is who pays in the long run. It's always just free money from somewhere. That seems to be how they act. It's just always free money from somewhere. Uh, and they need to get their fair share of it. Gail said, remember when Al Gross bragged about how easy it was to bill a million dollars? Yeah, that's exactly kind of what we're pointing at here. Uh, oh, hey, the other thing was, uh, I did see this, and Brad, I don't know if you saw this story this morning about the permanent fund basically nixing the aggressive investment plan, uh, it, you know, there that they had been talking about uh, to get the fund to $100 billion in a few years. Uh, wasn't that the Stedman and Giesel, weren't they big fans of that aggressive investing, says Gail? Maybe they're not entirely in the pocket of what's going on with the uh, powers that be in the Senate. But uh, yeah, I mean, that's a good piece of news, I guess, at least. Well, it is a good piece of news, sort of, for now. I mean, I, I don't think that battle's over. Basically, what happened yesterday was they had the special meeting where they could have engaged in uh, uh, in in various things, including... You know, debt finance, investing, borrowing a bunch of money in order to invest it on the expectation that the returns would exceed the cost of the debt. And they would they would get a margin off that like hedge funds do, um, essentially turning our permanent fund into a hedge fund. Uh, there was an, another proposal to be more aggressive uh, in investing uh, and uh, and go after higher risk uh, investments in the ex in the hope that they would result in higher reward. Uh, uh, higher payoffs. That's sort of what some of the retirement funds that have since gone bankrupt did. Um, and there were a couple of other proposals. I I didn't take what came out of yesterday's meeting as as a stake through the heart of those proposals. I took it more as, yeah, we're not ready to do that right yet because we really haven't explained it to anybody. Um, I suspect we will see efforts uh, to push those along because what the Dunleavy administration is trying to do, what those on the board who are pushing this, uh, who were appointed by Dunleavy, are trying to do is they're trying to get the permanent fund to a size where it can fund government. Forget about the PFD. They're not really concerned about the PFD. Right, get it to right. a size where they can fund government so they don't have to tax anybody uh, for the uh, for the additional spending so they can you know avoid those taxes. So it's... I, it, it is a it's it's a good thing that it didn't pass yesterday. I don't think it's dead, and it's something that I think we're going to be talking about uh, uh, until the next meeting in January uh, of the board. The next yeah, the next future meeting uh, of of the board as it goes for as they continue to push for this constitutional amendment to turn the uh, permanent fund into some kind of sovereign wealth fund or whatever, um, which again. Uh, just a huge mistake. Again, making us more dependent at every level on government. This is the other thing. And this is the thing that I've been warning about for 20 years in this state, that we are doing nothing but creating a dependency class in Alaska, and we continue to do so. I mean, one of the things that continues to stick out, and this has been true since Walker has been in office, but we currently have one third of Alaskans on medical welfare on Medicaid that, I mean, one third of the state, 270,000 people are on a government assistance, uh, in that regard. Uh, and, and that's a mind blowing number at this point, again, consumers versus producers. This is what you got. And Michael, I'm going to, I'm going to throw in my two cents on this. We've got one fifth of Alaskans, the top 20% who aren't paying for it. I mean, so you want to talk about dependence, government dependency, or or a dependent economy, or a or a, a subsidized economy. That's also part of the subsidized. It's true. Uh, I mean, 
you know, and, and I know, you know, we, oh, the successful Alaskans. Why should you pick on successful Alaskans? Well, when they're <laughs> when they're continuing their successful run on the backs of lower and middle income people, that's a problem. I'm not against being successful. I'm not exact. I'm not against the free market and the idea of making it and and uh, and doing well for yourself. But you can't throw the little people under the bus at the same time and say, I want all this stuff, but we're going to let the little people pay for it uh, throughout the time. By the way, my business is based on a lot of that stuff and we're going to have the little people pay for it. That's, I mean, that's where robber barons came from, right? I mean, that's the whole idea. I mean, that's exactly what that's all about. Oh, exactly right. And Michael, this, this myth that I'm trying to push costs off on the, on the top 20%, I'm not. If the top 20% had to pay, they would push back on the costs. The problem here is the Natasha von Imhoffs and others who say, oh, don't, you know, don't tax me to take it out of the PFD, tax middle and lower income Alaska families and continue to spend. If she had to pay, if Bert had to pay, if Click had to pay, if Giesel had to pay, they would be pushing back on spending. But right now, because they don't, because we're using PFD cuts, as the mechanism, the successful Alaskans don't care about, and, about and, spending. That's and the why, problem. And why would they be pushing back? Because their constituency, their donor class would also be pushing back on, whoa, 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 wait a second. I, I'm getting eaten alive here. you got to stop and slow down with the spending. But because it comes from this empty bucket that nobody ever sees, that's where we end up at. We're back. Brad Keithley, our guest, the weekly top three. Some good news and some bad news on education. Although I've got thoughts on this as well, Brad, uh, hit me, hit me with the, hit me with the thoughts here. Here this, we go. This is just this this whole segment is just an entire setup for your second hour. Oh, the <laughs> second hour, hour two is going to be on fire. I guarantee it. Right at this point. <laughs> All right. So there's an article in the Juno Empire um, uh, this week that says the headline is "School District Gets 2.8 Million of Bad News Due to Low Enrollment uh, and Audit." but also $2.3 million of good news. Well, the bad news is that uh, that enrollment in uh, in the Juneau School District is down. Guess where it's going? It's going to homeschooling, uh, but, uh, but, but, but enrollment's down. And so Juno's share of, uh, of state funds is gonna go down as a result of enrollment being down. Here's the, and, and, and that's, you know, that's bad news for Juno, not, not that I, care a lot about Juno, but there is, it's bad news. It's bad news for Juno. But here's the here's the good news that I think is is something that we need to recognize. Earlier in an earlier segment a few weeks ago, I talked about a an effort by the state started with Juno, but then expanding to other school districts to disallow uh, expenditures that were being made sort of on the side uh, by the by, the school district and booster clubs and others to help support various activities um, at the at the at the schools, disallowing disallowing those, um, and and essentially saying, look, you can't you can't spend those funds. The reason the state was saying that, as they explained it at the time, was it was causing some school districts to be more than what is it twenty percent, twenty five percent, spend more than twenty or twenty five percent higher than other school districts. And that put uh, federal uh, uh, rural assistant education funds uh, at risk. The federal, the feds have a rule that one district can't be more than X percent, 20 or 25 percent out of uh, disproportionately higher than, than other school districts. Um, and if they if they are, then the federal rural education existence uh, or assistance uh, uh, is terminated. And so the state was pressing back on Juno saying, look, these side funds that you're spending uh, are causing us to go in violation of the REA rule and putting at risk the federal funds that we're getting uh, from REA. There, there were two ways to handle that. One was, um, and, and so Juno was, Juno was, you know, complaining about having to cut back on those side funds. The, the, the point I made at the time was that was going to increase pressure on, on for K through 12 funding, because the one way to handle that is to increase funding to the lower school districts. Uh, and reduce the disproportion between the lower school districts and the and, and Juno, um, and so I was concerned that what this was that what the Dunleavy administration's effort was going to do was increase the pressure for K through 12 spending. Well, in this article down toward the bottom, there's a report that the Dunleavy administration has pulled back on pushing Juno and presumably the other school districts 
uh, right. on that rule. They're no longer going to disallow the funds that Juno's spending uh, on these these side these sideways uh, side approaches uh, be, be, and reduce it. Because Juno, because one of the exemptions from the federal rule is non-student, uh, not education costs like transportation. And that's what they were saying is that millions of these dollars were going into things like buses and transportation and stuff like that. And they said, wait, that's exempt. And the state has agreed. Oh, yeah, I guess we were wrong. Those were exempt. I, I don't. I, I The article is not clear and I've not had time to dig into it on exactly what's going on. I mean, the state was saying that the feds who make the rule and enforce the rule, it was the feds who were saying those side funds were violating the rule. And it could be that the state misinterpreted the feds. It could be that the state uh, 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 has pushed back on the feds and the feds are now saying that those side funds don't go, don't count. It also could be that the state has said, we're not going to worry about REA funds. Alaska is not the only state that, that theoretically can qualify for REA funds. And other states, when faced with this rule and the consequences of this rule, have said, we just won't take the REA funds. Um, so it could be that, that Alaska is saying, we just won't take the REA funds and, and we won't worry about this anymore. I, I, it's not clear from the article what's going on. And, and the Dunleavy administration has not been particularly clear on its website or elsewhere about what it's do, why it's doing what it's doing. But for, for whatever reason, it's pulling back on pushing uh, this issue with, uh, with Juno and, and, and counting these side funds or, or treating these side funds as a, as a problem. The administration is pulling back on that. The consequence of that is, is the pressure that that added on K through 12 funding to deal with this issue through increased K through 12 funding. That that pressure is going away, uh, and that's a good thing because because it means that at least that argument we're going to have other arguments, but at least that part of the argument for increased K through twelve uh, is sort of is sort of evaporating in the night. Well, and uh, of course that's good news, bad news, right? So the bad news is lower enrollment, which is not just a Juno problem, by the way. I'll point out that they're still they're just finishing up the counting period right now. Uh, for the state, right? And it's already been uh, pre pre predicted that there's going to be a, almost a record low enrollment across the state in the various districts. So everybody's going to be facing that. So that's the bad news. You're going to lose a bunch of money there based on student count. The good news is here, they get some of it back on the other side. But again, that's not what they're talking about is not necessarily dollars in the classroom, not that they're mandated to spend dollars in the classroom, but it's not education dollars as more as it is infrastructure dollars. Right. Right. It's, it's, it's what was going for, as you said, it was going to help support uh, various activities outside the classroom, the dollars that were going to help support various activities outside the classroom. Um, but it's it's um, I, I, it's welcome news. I mean, K through 12 is going to be a battle this time. It was a battle last year. It's going to be a battle this year. Uh, there are a lot of arguments uh, that are going to be made for it. But this at least at least this one is is seem seems on track to evaporate and not become a big part of the debate. Uh, Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Uh, it looks like, and it wasn't just Juno that received a letter. There were many other districts that right. after Juno was the first, right, but many right. other districts. Uh, and the article alludes to the fact that it looks like they may be pulling back, not just from Juno, but from other districts as well. Right. And and Juno was, Juno was sort of the canary in the coal mine, right? It was the first one that received the letter, the first one that was making the issue. And now it's the first one that's sort of indicating that that, that the issue is receding. Right. As I say, good news, not it's not going to it's not going to blow away the K through 12 argument, but at least it blows away one piece of the K through 12 argument. All right, Brad, uh, three minutes here. Final thoughts on all the weekly top three today. Any <laughs> final thoughts on number three? Uh, what uh, what 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 say you in this regard? Well, I just the, the, the subsidy, the subsidy argument, both uh, both that we discussed in the second segment. Uh, and the subsidy argument that we discussed in the first segment, the the uh, the, the subsidy of, of South Central uh, energy uh, consumers uh, by the state, uh, by the state's actions, the state's intervening in the market. Those are just troublesome. I mean, do we believe in markets or don't we? If we do believe in markets, we ought to let markets function. If we don't believe in markets, uh, then OK. But, you know. That, that creates all sorts of, of inefficiencies out there, creates all sorts of, of subsidies and creates all sorts of costs. 
in the case of the Cook Inlet, it's a cost that will be spread uh, by uh, spread throughout uh, throughout the state. Essentially, the state, essentially what the Dunleavy administration is proposing is that the state subsidize uh, uh, South Central. It was telling that in the uh, that in the uh, legislature, the Alaska House Majority's letter, it was three South Central legislators that were quoted. Uh, George Rauscher, uh, uh, Tom McKay, and uh, and Ben Carpenter that were quoted as saying, yeah, we're, we're going to give this deep consideration. Well, hell yeah, they're subsidizing your ratepayers. I guess so. But but let's let's look at the overall let's look at the overall consequence of of, of what's going on. And the same thing's true of Medicaid. I we, we we need to keep in mind that markets work, but for markets to work, we have to let them work, and we have to let. Uh, 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 the state, we have to keep the state out of it and allow the market to go forward. And, and I just, uh, it's frustrating to see, you know, it's frustrating enough to deal with that when Democrats argument argue that we need to intervene in the market. It's hugely frustrating to see Republicans now start to argue that we need to inter intervene in the market. And they'll say, oh, it's just this one, just this market, but it's, but it's intervention in the market. And that then, you know, just triggers off all sorts of inefficiencies and all sorts of cross subsidies. We need to we need to let markets work. Yeah. Well, again, the major problem with this in the state of Alaska is the fact that the public and the private economies are divorced from each other and they don't want to let the market work because they don't care about the market. They believe that the government knows best. And as long as the government economy is doing fine, everything's fine, 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 just fine. You know, the room's on fire, but this is fine. And that's where we're at right now. I mean, that's that's really the case here, Brad, right? I mean, the, the, it doesn't matter if you're a D or an R in this state. Um, and I, I read through all the statements that the House majority put out. And uh, I mean, Ben Carpenter, who I'm a, I'm, a ham, I'm a huge fan of Ben Carpenter. At least he said, I said, I'm looking forward to discussing this proposal in the months ahead. I don't take that as an implicit endorsement necessarily. But um, I mean, I, I think it's going to be interesting. But again, this all leaks back. This all trickles down from the fact that Alaskans, the Alaska economy is busted. It's not intertwined like every other state. Every other state, the public and the private economy are inexorably intertwined and they they have to work together. And in Alaska, it just does it just don't matter. It just don't matter. The state's gonna do what the state's gonna do as long as the state has control. It doesn't matter what happens in the private economy because they don't care. And, uh, you know, unless, of course, maybe it affects their donor class. Anchorage is the largest, of course, community in the state. And if they don't subsidize those guys, those folks might get mad if their energy cost goes up. Try living in Fairbanks for a while to see how your, your, heating, your heating and your energy costs go up uh, every, every month, every year. I can't even, to do the calculation on how much I've saved by moving to the South Central area, you have no idea. I mean, I still pay, I think I, I, think I probably pay... 20, 20, maybe 25% on an annual basis for heating of what I paid in Fairbanks right now. Um, just think about that for a minute. I mean, the, the, the amazing savings just in that area alone, but we wouldn't want Anchorage or South Central to pay any more because that's the donor class and we don't want to, you know, that's the big chunk of people and we don't want to mess with them in that regard. But again, it's that disconnect. Am I, am I wrong? No, no, you're exactly, you're exactly right, Michael. I mean, you're exactly right. Everybody, <laughs> I mean, part of the problem, we, we've disrupted markets so much in this state that we don't really understand when we're doing it anymore. I mean, we, we've allowed the government to become such a big player uh, in, in, in what goes on in this state that that it's just I mean the 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 first reaction Dunleavy's first reaction is oh well we'll just you know we'll just give away royalty we'll just take away royalty they've already taken away tax in Cook Inlet that was that was gone in the two thousands uh, at some point tax got got eliminated now it's now it's, we're going to take away royalty now we're going to zero out out royalty it, it, you don't even think I mean it, it government is so intertwined with a, with with how things operate in this state that it's the reaction is always, well, we'll do something. Government will do something. We'll we'll give away another subsidy. We'll create another freebie, um, uh, so that uh, so that that disruption doesn't doesn't occur. And it's just I, at at some point at some point you want it to stop, but to get it to stop, you've got to point out when it's happening. And and I I'm I would doubt that George Rauscher understands what he's understands. 
that he's arguing for a subsidy. I would I would bet he would say he's not doing that. But that's exactly what he's doing. And 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 to get this stuff to stop, to get back to a market economy, to create a market economy in Alaska, you've got to point out when this stuff's going on. And this is this is as clear an example as any of the other examples. It's as clear an, exa- an example as Donna Mears's we need more money. We need we need all that federal money to support the state because otherwise we'll go into a recession. This is the Republican equivalent of Donna Mears saying we need to re, we need to reduce royalty or else the you know Anchorage will have to pay more for energy. No, oh, that's horrible. I mean, it's wow. just and the state can do something about it. My gosh, you know we can we can give away more money. So let us give away more money. How shocking! We have to be seen doing something about this. We've got to do something, you know. And it's always and it's always going backwards. Yeah. It's always it's always yes, we'll give you more money. You know, in Parnell's yes. in Parnell's day is yes, we'll give you state savings. Here, take take money, take take state money. Don't don't negotiate a higher price for the Cook Inlet that, that would incentivize production. Here, just take state money to to <laughs> keep your margins where they otherwise would be. Oh my God, this explains a lot. I'm going to post this comment just because I think it explains everything at this point. Here's Harold's comment. This is why uh, we offer, this is why we don't offer private sector services and only focus on government spending. Got to pay the, he's, what he's saying is his business does not provide private sector services. He only, he, he's focused on the government spend too. That explains a lot at this point. That just that explains a whole hell of a lot at this well, point. And Go and and docs. I mean, to pick up on Donna Mears's yeah, thing, I mean, thing again. Docs. Oh my God! Don't cut Medicaid. I mean, yeah. my God, what would we do without without Medicaid revenues? We'd have to, you know, actually go out and get services in the in the private sector. We'd have to, you know, deal with costs in the in the private sector, uh, yeah. lower our costs there. I well, mean, don't it, don't again, cut Medicaid. Docs, telecom construction, road crews, herald services, all of those businesses that are predicated exclusively on government spending. Big shocker uh, that they're upset when uh, with that. I mean, you know, we are creating a dependency economy, period. And (laughs) and we're reaping we're reaping those rewards right now. That's what's happening. Right, Brad? Creating. We've created. Well, we've created. Yes, you're right. 100 percent. We're adding to it. I stand corrected. You are 100%. We have created and we are continuing to foster a dependency economy in this state. That's And, that, that's, and, that's, and that's what this royalty proposal is. That's what the Dunleavy uh, royalty proposal is, is, is to continue to foster this dependency economy by having the state subsidize South Central energy costs by reducing by reducing the supply side costs. It's just yeah. just continuing. Then talked himself into it, taxing Alaskans. Oh. Uh, Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Brad, thank you so much for coming on board today and uh, joining us. We appreciate that. Michael, as always, thanks for having me and have a great second hour. Oh, man. Get ready for it, folks. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the weekly top three from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages. And keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the Weekly Top 3.